Well, hello, this is Tanner Dyken, pastor at Open Door Baptist Church in Mayfield, Kentucky. And uh, I'm just doing a, uh, a quick video uh, here to make up for some uh, footage that uh, we lost uh, a couple of weeks ago during our Sunday morning service. Um, I had been going through prior to Christmas, I had been going through the uh, various uh, historic covenants in the Old Testament and showing how they... Uh, how they worked, uh, you know, sort of together and how they, they progress and, and they, uh, reveal Christ that there, there's a promise of, of Christ in those covenants. Uh, and the, the covenant that I, uh, when I, when I went to do the Noahic covenant, um, the video audio didn't, uh, didn't work quite right. And uh, so I'm, I'm remaking uh, just a, a little bit of a makeup here. Uh, this won't be uh, like a sermon, but I, I wanted to nonetheless get some of this material uh, put to uh, a me uh, audio, uh, audio medium so that people can, uh, can listen to it uh, so that uh, our congregation has this as uh, uh, some notes that they can go back and listen to. Uh, and if you're uh, joining us from outside the congregation, well, uh, welcome to you, and uh, I hope you enjoy this. Um, the passage that we were looking at uh, on that day uh, was Genesis 8, verse 20, through to chapter 9, verse 2, and we, we study, uh, studied quite a bit around that as well. The passage reads, And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelt a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night, shall not cease. And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. And the fear of you, and the dread of you, shall be upon every beast of the field, and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. And so th this was the passage that we uh, were looking at. And the first note that we made in that passage is that the covenant that's being made to Noah after the flood was a gracious covenant. It, it was a covenant that was not earned on Noah's part. He did not deserve uh, to be the recipient of this covenant. Um, we notice in verse 21, the Lord smelled a sweet savor and the Lord said in his heart, that is, in his own heart, according to his own will and desire, not according to uh, externals, but, but according to his own heart. In chapter 9, in verse 9, we have this reiterated. I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. So you notice that he, he says twice, he says, I, behold, I establish my covenant with you. Uh, that's to say that, that this is his own doing. It, it's not... Uh, a cooperative effort, uh, but it is God alone that establishes this covenant with Noah. And uh, we even see that God bringing Noah through the flood safely with his family was a gracious act. Uh, from beginning to end, all of God's dealings with Noah uh, was uh, were gracious. Uh, in Genesis 6 verse 5, uh, we read that God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowl of the air. And it repented me, it repenteth me, that I have made them. Uh, so... Uh, God saw that, that all of man, including Noah and his family, uh, that all of the imaginations of the thoughts of their heart was only evil continually. Um, he, he, he knew the depravity of man, including Noah and his household. And yet, it says in 
chapter 6 and verse 8, that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He, he did not deserve this. It was grace that God uh, was showing towards him. Uh, we even see in our own passage, in chapter 8, verse 21, uh, that the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is, is evil from his youth. Even at that time, uh, God knew that all of man, that is Adam, uh, Noah and his family, uh, that their uh, thoughts of their heart, the imagination of their heart, was only evil from their youth. Uh, even then, he knew they were evil. And even more so, God knew that they would continue to sin, uh, that there would be grievous sin in their family. Uh, in Genesis 9, verse 20, Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Cain, saw his father and told his two brethren without. So there, there are several sins that are going on here. Uh, first is, of course, the sin of drunkenness that, that Noah was engaged in. Uh, as soon as he got off the ark, some of you know said that uh, he went straight to work planting a vineyard and he immediately became drunk uh, of the fruit of his labors. Um, and so because of this, because of his drunkenness, he was also unable to uh, protect his family from further wickedness. Uh, he was drunk in his tent and he was uncovered in his tent. Uh, he was completely uh, caught off guard because of his drunkenness here. Uh, and uh, there's even a, a further sin that occurs here, the sin of Ham. And some have uh, speculated differently about what kind of sin Ham committed here. Some uh, have said that the sin was that he saw his father and jested, uh, that he, uh, he saw that his father was naked and he saw the shame of his father and he went and he joked about it with his brothers. Um, the perspective I take about this is that it's a much more heinous sin, though. Um, if we look at Leviticus 18 and verse 8, we learn that uh, the wife is the nakedness of her husband. Uh, what is likely happening here, uh, uh, the perspective that I take on this, is that this is a case of maternal rape, and so a, a very heinous sin, and uh, so not lingering too long on that. Uh, God knew that this was a depraved family still, uh, that this family uh, had sinned, uh, that they were actively in sin, and that they would sin in the future. And yet, God establishes his covenant with them. I, behold, I establish my covenant. Uh, God himself does this. Um, and this is the theme of all the covenants, that even though we are unworthy, even though the recipients of the covenant are, are not good people, yet God has been gracious to them. Uh, Psalm 8 verse 4 says, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Uh, God, in this covenant, is showing his grace to even establish this relationship in the first place. Nonetheless, we also see that in this covenant there is a law given. Uh, just as with all the other covenants, there is a law that is given with this one. Uh, this covenant includes all of the promises or all of the law that was given in the Adamic covenant to Adam. Uh, and it adds an explicit uh, condemnation of murder. In chapter 9 in verse 5, Surely your blood of your lives will I require, and at the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. So the, this uh, condemnation of murder is given here, as well as a reiteration that man is made in the image of God, and he has all of the responsibilities attendant upon that status. Uh, and so we see that there is also a, a law. And so the, the covenant is gracious, but God gives a law with it. And, and so it, uh, it's a, a little bit paradoxical, uh, we could say, uh, that, that even though it's a gracious covenant, 
God gives a law. And we might ask, well, why, how is it then gracious if God gives a law? And the answer to that is that when God gives a law as the conditions for receiving his blessings, it is always so that he himself can fulfill that law. He has set up the, the uh, law beforehand so that he can then uh, fulfill his law. In Matthew 5, 17, of course, we know that this is chiefly in Christ. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Law is only another form of God's promises to us. And those are the promises concerning Christ, what he will do. Um, and so uh, he gives a law with it. And we'll see as we go on more about Christ. But now let's look at some of the promises given in this covenant. And first there is the promise that God will preserve a people. In chapter 8 and verse 21, the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So God says he will no more curse the ground. Uh, that is so that man may provide for himself, uh, that, that the earth will, uh, will be uh, uh, cultivatable, that, that he'll be able to, uh, to use it for his, uh, for his needs, uh, that God will no more smite uh, any uh, or all living flesh from the earth as he has done. He, he will no more destroy the whole earth. And that while the earth remains, in verse 22, times and seasons will not fail, that there will be a predictable order to the world uh, for uh, the security of mankind, uh, so that in uh, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, day and night, they shall not cease for the benefit of mankind, so that man can manage. Uh, God promises to preserve mankind by this. Uh, he again promises this in chapter 9, verse 9. I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. He even promises for descendants. In verse 11 of chapter 9, I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there be any more a flood to destroy the earth. And all of this is, is summed up very well in Isaiah 54, verse 8. A little, in a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment. But with everlasting kindness have I mer uh, will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. Uh, so it, God's mercy is, is shown forth here uh, as an everlasting mercy uh, for, by means of his promise not to destroy the earth by a flood anymore. Uh, in this also is, is included the promise of descendants, uh, as we've noted. Uh, and specifically, it is the continuation of the promise given in Genesis 3.14 about the seed of the woman. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel." Uh, the, the promise of a descendant given to uh, the woman that it would des it would destroy the enemies of God's people uh, that it would stand for uh, God's people and uh, it would be wounded for us and yet in its wo being wounded it would destroy our enemies this is continued in this promise to Noah and his family that they would have children uh, that, that through their descendants, this promise would be fulfilled. And then there's also, um, in, the, in this covenant, the promise of a mediator. 
that God would give us someone to stand for us, to mediate for us in heaven. In chapter 9, verse 12, God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth, and uh, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. So there, here's the promise of the mediator, that, that uh, God would set his bow in the cloud, he would set the rainbow up to stand in heaven between God and man, so that when God brought a cloud over the earth to, to rain on the earth, that the bow would be seen in the cloud, and he would not uh, allow the waters to be a flood over all the earth to destroy all flesh. Uh, this uh, this this promise of a mediator standing in heaven between God and man. And this readily fits in with that promise of a seed, uh, that the uh, seed of the woman would stand for mankind, would defeat man, uh, the enemies of God and man on behalf of mankind. Um, and and this, this mediator, of course, would stand in heaven to do this. Uh, he, he would stand between God and man, to intercede for man uh, so that God would not destroy him uh, in his wrath. And there's also, um, in, in the context of the whole Bible, uh, this uh, mediator is identifiable as God himself. Uh, in Ezekiel 1 verse 28, we see why this is. Uh, we read uh, of the appearance of, of the glory of God as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. So the, the sign of the rainbow is actually uh, likened to the glory of God himself. Uh, God, when he came in his glory to Ezekiel and he showed himself, uh, this is, is said to be the same likeness as the rainbow, as far as the glory, the beauty of it. Uh, that the, the rainbow is a sort of created uh, likeness to that, a created reminder uh, of, the, of, of that majesty of God. Uh, and so we see that the mediator standing in the cloud uh, in, in, in heaven is God himself, that he will stand between God and man, and he will plead his own case. For his people. And finally, of course, this is the promise of Christ. Uh, we've seen through all of this that, that this is exactly what Jesus did for us. In 1 Timothy 2 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. He is the one mediator. Jesus Christ gave his self a ransom for all. In Hebrews 7, 24, This man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, and then for, his, uh, for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. He is able to save to the uttermost. He makes intercession for us to that end. And he is made higher than the heavens. Uh, he is even made higher than the created sign of the rainbow, which only sits uh, in uh, the clouds. Uh, Christ has passed into the highest of heavens and stands before his Father in heaven to make intercession for us. And not only does he uh, mediate on our behalf, but he has also proclaimed victory over Satan, just as mankind is supposed to do, just as, as man was sent out 
uh, into the world, to, to have dominion, to subdue all the earth, uh, and to, to, that all the earth would, would be under man's rule, Jesus Christ fulfills this promise uh, also, uh, this requirement. Uh, in 1 Peter 3, verse 8, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. So Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, and when he was, uh, when he was buried and he descended into, uh, into uh, the grave, he descended into uh, hell, uh, down to where the um, the uh, deceased spirits uh, were, uh, Jesus went and he preached against those same spirits which were disobedient in the days of Noah. Uh, those same spirits that are spoken about in uh, Genesis chapter six. He went and he preached their defeat. Uh, he he declared his victory over them. So that, as we read in verse 21, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. He did this so that he could uh, save his people so that, that he, in passing into the heavens, could be our mediator. So that just as it says, by the answer of a good conscience toward God, that is, by faith, by trusting in Jesus Christ, that we can be saved by him. And so uh, what we have here is, is once again, just another um, reminder that God's promises have been the same from the beginning that he has continued to reveal that he himself will save his people. And that's exactly what he's done in Jesus Christ. Christ came. Christ did all of these things. He fulfilled the promises made to Noah, uh, and he did so perfectly. And so uh, I hope that this serves as help to any believers that are watching this uh, and or listening to this. And if there are any unbelievers, anyone who does not uh, know Jesus Christ, uh, I would simply call on you to trust in him today. Uh, John 1.17 says that the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And John 3.17 says that God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. That is, if you trust him, if you have faith in him, you will not be condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. If you do not trust in him, if you do not uh, believe in him to the saving of your soul, you are condemned already. You have already broken God's law. We saw earlier the law that was given to Noah. Uh, you have broken even that law, the, the law against murders. Because all murder begins in the heart. And Jesus told us in Matthew 5, 21, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, that is, to, to curse him. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of of hellfire. Uh, Jesus said that to simply be angry with your fellow man without a cause is the same kind of sin as murder. And so you being guilty before God need Jesus Christ to do this work of intercession, to acquire mercy on your behalf. And so I pray that you would come and trust in Jesus Christ. He that believeth on him is not condemned. And so uh, I pray that there's uh, somebody that listens to this and comes to faith in Christ. And so for that, hopefully, uh, again, uh, some people have got some good use out of this uh, and look forward to some more uh, content coming out 
uh, in the near future. So blessings.